Hello, Matthew Legg is joining us today. He's written this book, Are We Done Fighting? Building Understanding in a World of Hate and Division. Matthew has worked for a nonprofit sector for the last 13 years with a focus on building health, dignity, and human rights. He supported locally led peace initiatives in North America, Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. He served as a volunteer, a coordinator, board member, and full time staff member. Since 2012, Matthew has worked with the Canadian Friends Service Committee, the Peace and Social Justice Agents of Quakers. In Canada, Quakers are widely respected for their efforts to prevent war and transform conflicts. Matthew's fascination with how diverse cultures organize themselves to address different challenges led him to a degree in anthropology from the University of Toronto. He served for six years on the board of directors of the Ontario Council for International Cooperation. This is his first book and he writes the popular blog, Are We Done Fighting for Psychology Today? Welcome to BC, Matthew. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah. I understand you're on a book tour promoting your new book. Are We Done Fighting? Building Understanding in a World of Hate and Division. How has it been so far? It's been great so far. It's been really interesting. Uh, I've had the chance to talk so far in Duncan, uh, in Nanaimo, and uh, yesterday in Gabriel Island, and before that in Vancouver. Yeah. Great, great. How did this book come about? And what is your personal interest in writing this book? So it came about, there were a lot of factors involved, but one of them was that I was hearing all kinds of really great stories about people who had skills that I had never really thought about. So we're talking about folks who are able to transform violent conflicts without violence. And I just didn't think that that was possible. So I was really curious, what's going on in these situations? And so I wanted to look into what are some findings from different academic disciplines and how does it explain what's happening? Um, and, and does it confirm what I want to believe? Does it disconfirm what I want to believe? So, so I also changed my mind a lot and learned a lot from, from writing this. Mm -hmm. When writing the book, who did you think would be your target audience? Good question. I guess I was writing it for a general audience and actually for the skeptic, like, like myself as well. So I didn't want to just take any of this stuff that we can, we can have more effective conflicts just based on faith. I wanted to really test it and try to disprove what I wanted to believe, see if there was evidence that showed that people are actually, um, you know, really these difficult, horrible monsters that sometimes we're told that we are. And the evidence that I found suggests a wide range of, of phenomena. There was very few things that are all good or all bad. There's a lot of gray area. But um, what I really learned is that power is totally different from what I thought it was. Mm, and we, we have a lot more power than we might think. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Your book is very well researched. There's about 750 citations. What surprised you the most when you did this research? Yeah, so, so all kinds of things were surprising to me. Um, one of the things that was really surprising was when looking into findings from every single field, um, say neuroscience, social psychology, behavioral economics, um, there's nowhere that I could find something that's just not contested. Like people are disagreeing on everything. Mm -hmm. And even among the very cleverest scientists, they're often having very, to my mind, um, destructive and not that useful types of disagreements. So uh, that was a big surprise to me to see just how how many people who are really really bright, very very clever, very well formally educated, also lack these really important skills that are so fundamental to life. Mm -hmm. And so those skills of constructive communication and, and having better quality conflicts, better quality disagreements, um, can be learned, and I saw some really great examples of that um, throughout the book, yeah. Is the one example in particular that sticks out for you? 
Uh, I could give lots of stories or examples. Um, one that I thought is really fascinating is Megan Phelps Roper. So she was a, a member of the Westboro Baptist Church, which many people know goes and um, protests um, and, and holds up signs saying things like, um, God hates Jews. And so considered a hate group by, by many people. And she was um, born into that, that was her identity, that was her full community, and people were able to actually reach out to her and have a constructive conversation with her via Twitter. I thought that was just incredible. Twitter? Uh, yeah. And so this ability to, to connect with people, to touch people, it can happen in all kinds of ways, but first we have to believe that it's possible. And if you had asked me before researching this book, is it possible that you can get someone to leave a hate group just via tweeting with them? I would have said, no, that's not really possible. So there are, you know, that's not to say that every time it's going to work. There's always challenges in every situation and it takes a lot of time uh, in a really serious um, conflict like that one where you're trying to actually change someone's whole identity and their belief system mm -hmm. but but there are lots of amazing stories of different types of successes mm -hmm. yeah so when they did these tweets so they were just asking her questions is that how it worked yeah so there were a lot of people on Twitter as you can imagine who were just angrily tweeting at her that you know she's an evil person and she shouldn't be doing what she was doing and the thing is if you believe that what you're doing is righteous, which almost all of us do believe that for whatever reasons, um, it's very easy to discount somebody who's just saying, oh, you're being evil and so on, because actually they kind of help you to strengthen your identity because you see yourself as then you're a righteous outsider who's being tarred and feathered or attacked for whatever view you want to hold, right? Mm -hmm. So those people didn't do anything to change her mind in, in just attacking her and insulting her. But there were other people on, on Twitter who were actually being more constructive and they were showing some curiosity and they were approaching her to ask and to find out, how did you come to believe these things? Mm -hmm. And so they weren't just attacking, they were also having conversation about her as a person and building up some level of connection with her. And th this was a slow process, it took a long time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So your book discusses nonviolent approaches to social change. What do you say to people who don't believe that nonviolence would work? Right, yeah. Nonviolence and social change is a really interesting one because our common sense would be that governments aren't going to take you very seriously unless you have guns. Um, we're talking about uh, overthrowing dictatorships, let's say, uh, for example. The, the evidence suggests that not only do um, social change movements to um, overthrow a dictator uh, fail more regularly um, when, they, when they use guns, but actually they're, they're about twice as likely to succeed when they're, com when they're completely nonviolent. Mm. So why is that? It seems to be that a big part of this is about nonviolence is considered by the public, whether rightly or wrongly doesn't matter, it's considered to be more morally acceptable. Mm -hmm. And so if you are using a more morally acceptable technique, mm -hmm. you're going to bring more people on board with you. And when you bring more people on board, they bring their social networks on board. Mm -hmm. So you're able to get a much bigger movement going and you're able to sustain it for longer. And the opposite also happens. If you start breaking things or using violence, there's some evidence that suggests that then people's sympathy declines. Mm -hmm. And so we saw this in a, a recent paper that was just published about riots in Barcelona, for instance. Mm -hmm. So when a movement turns violent, it tends to lose public support of the people who aren't already very supportive. The people who are very supportive, they're going to support it no matter what. But if you want a movement to succeed, you need to reach beyond the choir. You need to get those people who are on the fence. And only nonviolent movements seem to do that really effectively, or most of the time that's the case. Within your research, did you find out there was one specific cause for conflict? There are a lot of important causes and I don't want to try to boil it down to just one. So one thing that I really tried to do in the book is keep it um, bringing in these different factors, make sure that it wasn't oversimplified. Because I think actually one of our biggest problems in a lot of conflicts is that we tend to go into simplistic thinking. So that's very simple binary logic of I'm right, you're wrong. I'm the one, you're the zero. 
and then we're in total opposition. We're in a what's called a zero-sum game where I can only win when you lose and you only win when I lose. And if we have that kind of a dynamic, that's really promoting a destructive conflict, right? So there are very easy ways to get into that dynamic and there are actually some very useful and easy tips to get out of that dynamic and have a more constructive and healthy conflict as well. So basically you're saying it's not simplistic, it's very complex. Yeah, so actually when we start looking especially at bigger scale entrenched conflicts, mm -hmm. something that goes on for a long time like say Israel-Palestine, mm -hmm. Um, there were all kinds of different authors each pro proposing that they had found the one key cause of that conflict. Mm -hmm. And so when a researcher did a literature review and started um, compiling what are those key causes, he actually found that there were 57 different principal causes being proposed as this is the one cause of this conflict. So they're complicated and I think each of those causes is probably relevant. So um, working in a complex system is a real challenge because there isn't this simple checklist of just do these three things and then there'll be peace in Israel-Palestine. So from what you're saying, I think that your, your book is sort of aimed at people who are looking for improvement in their own personal relationship. It also could work for activists who are working um, to try and bring more social change. Absolutely, yeah. So I wanted to write the book for, for any type of audience. So it could be used even to build your own inner peace. There's a whole section on inner peace and the violence that we do to ourselves, which I think is really important. Um, and it can be used for any type of cause. I think it can be complementary to any type of activist cause that people are doing to just um, peace within a workplace or a family, just more constructive, creative uh, conversations. Great. Okay. Uh, is there anything that you would like to add in this very short interview? Uh, no, just there's a lot of content in the book on all kinds of topics and I want um, folks to know that it's really designed to be useful for readers. So the purpose is that you can pick it up and you can make use of it right away. There are short chapters with tips at the end so you can put them into your daily practice right away. And there's also activities so you can use it in a study group and really have a rich learning experience which is I think the ultimate goal. If you want to get the most out of the book then experience it, practice it, do it in a study group and I think you'll have a great experience. And where can people find out more about this book? Uh, it's available on arewedonefighting.com. You can download a free chapter and it's available on all of the online bookstores. You can get it in an ebook or a print copy and some uh, in-person brick and mortar bookstores have it as well. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.